Welcome to Illuminate the Challenge. My name is Rob Bell, a frequent commentator on global business topics. This talk was given as the keynote at the Illuminate Conference on AI held in Stavanger, Norway on the 26th of April 2023 at the invitation of CADME, knowledge and data management specialists working with a range of AI applications. The purpose of this opening talk was to provide an overview of the AI landscape and then trigger debate. Let's get started. If you were to drive down a street and a traffic light had all colours blazing at once, what would you do? This is a bit like business and AI. There are those who go on green, full speed ahead. AI is the solution to all ills. We can't waste time on regulation. Then those on amber, convinced of potential benefits but cautious on speed going forward. And then those on red. We need to stop before AI gets completely out of control. As Elon Musk made plain, this could be man's last invention. Scientist Stephen Hawking was one of the signatories of a warning to the world. Sam Altman of OpenAI asks similar questions. This webinar seeks to unpack the definitions and explore potential impacts. Is it going to be red? Is it going to be amber? Or is it going to be green? Here's the three-part agenda. Context, pros and cons, and then the challenge. First up, some need-to-know context. Not everyone is in the know, so what are we talking about? Here's three working definitions. First up, AI. This is any technique that enables computers to mimic human intelligence using logic, if-then rules, decision trees, and machine learning. What is machine learning? The subset of AI that includes statistical techniques that enable machines to improve performance on tasks with experience. And deep learning, the subset of machine learning composed of algorithms that permit software to train itself to perform tasks like speech and image recognition by exposing multi-layered neural networks to vast amounts of data. Building on these working definitions, we need to be more specific on AI itself. There are three types. First, artificial narrow intelligence. That's A-N-I. This is where we are now, and that's often called weak AI, replacing repetitive tasks, not jobs. And two, artificial general intelligence. This is strong AI. And here, AGI can learn to accomplish any intellectual task that human beings or other animals can perform. Alternatively, AGI has been defined as an autonomous system that surpasses human capabilities in the majority of economically valuable tasks. And third, Artificial superintelligence. A superintelligence is a hypothetical agent that possesses intelligence far surpassing that of the brightest and most gifted human minds. This could be man's last invention. And now a brief history of AI so far. 1956, John McCarthy, globally referred to as the father of AI, coined the term artificial intelligence, which he defines as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. McCarthy introduced his definition of artificial intelligence during a conference at Dartmouth College in the summer of 1956. And on to 1969, the first general-purpose robot was launched. 1997, the first supercomputer. This was IBM's Deep Blue, which we'll look at in a moment. Then 2002, the first commercial robotic vacuum cleaner is launched. And 2005, AI comes, as we shall see, comes of age with a raft of applications. 
The prequel to AI's launch in 1956 has to be the word robot. It was the brainchild of the Czech playwright, novelist and journalist Karol Šepek, who introduced it in his 1920 play R.U.R., or Rossum's Universal Robot. The word itself comes from an old church Slavonic word, rabota, which means servitude of forced labour. Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction writer, used this in his 1942 novel, I, Robot. This is an important book because it introduces Asimov's three laws of robotics. First law, a robot may not injure a human being. Second law, a robot must obey orders given to it by humans. And third law, a robot must protect its own existence. Hold these thoughts. Now back to 1956. Two revolutionary things happen. First, John McCarthy coins the term artificial intelligence in Dartmouth, USA. This is seen as the birth of AI. And then second, the launch of The Box. Malcolm McLean, truck fleet owner, sends 58 boxes or containers from Hoboken, New Jersey to Houston. And this sparks a containerized revolution. The Box demonstrates how disruptive technology can be. This chart is taken from the Financial Times, and it's what happens with a disruption of age-old routines. That's loading and unloading practices. From 1950 to 2020, we've seen a dramatic explosion of global trade. 1950, 61 billion US dollars. 2020, 19 trillion US dollars. The box, that's containerization, was the building block that made this possible. AI could be even more disruptive, and the size of the market in 2021 was US dollars 130 6 billion and by 2030 this could reach 1.8 trillion US dollars. In 1997, Garry Kasparov, the then chess world champion, played Deep Blue, that's IBM's chess playing computer, and he lost. It was a watershed moment. This was the first time that a computer had prevailed against a world chess champion, a groundbreaking accomplishment for AI. And yet, Deep Blue used brute force, a huge database of chess openings, middle games and closers, with the computing power to work the options far speedier than any human could achieve. And then AlphaGo. This was AI coming of age. DeepMind's AlphaGo defeated world Go champion Lee Sedol in 2016. Chess is complex, but after the first two moves, there are 400 possible text moves, whereas in Go, there are close to 130,000. Unlike Deep Blue, AlphaGo did not consider all possible moves. Instead, AlphaGo used deep learning to focus on the best positions. Today, we see AI at work in our smartphones and coverage has exploded. Much of this progress is down to neural networks and they are focused on AlphaGo as the parent. For an optimistic view of AI, as we close this first section on context, we turn to James Lovelock, creator of the Gaia Hypothesis and one of the greatest environmental thinkers of our time. Lovelock turned 100 in 2019 and produced this book, Novacine. Here, he talks of the future of life on Earth. He argues that the Anthropocene, the age in which humans have shaped the Earth just as natural phenomena during other geological ages, such as the Jurassic, is closing. A new age, the Novocene, has already begun. What does this look like? Lovelock describes how new beings will emerge from existing artificial intelligence systems. They'll think 10,000 times faster than we do, and they will regard us, as we now regard plants, as desperately slow but thinking creatures. And yet, this will not be the cruel, violent machine takeover of the planet imagined by sci-fi writers and filmmakers. These hyper-intelligent beings will be as dependent on the health of the planet as we are. And now, with examples, more on the pros and cons of AI. 
We've established three types of AI. ANI, which has a narrow range of abilities, more tasks than jobs. AGI, general intelligence, which is on a par with human capabilities. And then ASI, super intelligence, and this is more capable than a human. Here's super intelligence from Nick Bostrom, one of the leading thinkers on AI, in which he explores paths, dangers and strategies to cope with super intelligence. He starts with the unfinished fable of the sparrows. A flock of sparrows decides that they would benefit if they had an owl to help them out. One member of the flock, Skronkfinkel, objects, saying, should we not give some thought to the art of owl domestication and owl taming before we bring such a creature into our midst? In short, the other sparrows ignore the warning and off they go to find an owlet to rear. The fable ends. We're left wondering what will happen to the sparrows when the owl is fully grown. Will it work in the interest of sparrows or is this a dangerous assumption that could destroy the nest. And you could say this is where the debate begins. Is AI a force for good or a force for evil? The web is full of videos and podcasts that enthuse about or question our assumptions on AI. Lex Friedman's superb podcast series carries many debates with all the leading figures in AI developments. Sam Altman of OpenAI, the home of Chat GPT, Max Tegmark, Stephen Hawking, Yudkowsky, Brockman, Russell, and many more. In a nutshell, and this is a complex debate, but it boils down to two main questions. Can we? Does AI improve our capabilities or our productivity? Few would dispute this. Then, more fundamentally, should we? This question has many of the above asking for a pause in AI research. Should we is all about ensuring alignment with human values. And here's a third perspective. What order do we ask the questions? If we postpone debate on should we, it could be too late. Man's last invention. So, what do we do? Let's sharpen the debate. The Economist recently ran a leader on how to worry wisely about AI. The New York Times highlights how desperate people are to be regulated, even if this slows them down. More intriguingly, the argument runs that competition, so essential to modern-day capitalism, is forcing everyone to go too fast and cut corners. No company can slow down to a safe pace without risking irrelevancy. Regulation is needed. But what type of regulation does this mean? The Americans, the EU, the UK and China all have differing views. What of India and the rest of the developing world where many AI applications are building momentum? What is at stake? What's at stake? Well, banks are already seeing AI as important. 60% in one survey are using this for data analysis and insight. 59% increased productivity. 54% cost savings and benefits. These numbers are a movable feast. They're changing all the time. And many reports and different sources emphasize the key point that AI is changing the business model. So let's explore some more specific challenges that AI is helping to address. For many, the big story has been autonomous vehicles. NVIDIA is a groundbreaking company in this area, and autonomous car developers use NVIDIA Drive Car technology to teach self-driving cars to see, think, and learn. These days, NVIDIA is deploying these insights into autonomous objects. Here, we highlight the autonomous car and then a serious challenge – the behavior of pedestrians, how the autonomous car responds to context, and each pedestrian has a mind of their own. We move on. Let's consider global food and protein security. This is a major problem, ever more complex with disruptions from climate, COVID, and 
conflict. Specifically, if we consider fruit and vegetables, post-harvest losses across Africa are averaging 40%. In Ghana, tomatoes can reach over 65% PHL post-harvest losses. This is unsustainable and compounded by high youth unemployment, livelihoods are at stake. AI can speed up solutions and network portals offer better access to support. There are numerous advantages of AI in agriculture. AI can facilitate and enable a more efficient way to produce, harvest and sell essential crops. Implementing AI-empowered approaches in farming can help farmers respond smartly to climate change. We can place sensors and use apps to focus and improve many areas of activity, as illustrated in the photo. Analyzing market demand. AI can simplify crop selection and help farmers identify what produce will be most profitable. It can help to manage risk, breeding the right variety of seeds and monitoring soil health. It can be used at protecting crops, feeding crops and harvesting itself. What's the size of the prize? Well, with 40% post-harvest losses in the midst of a food and protein security crisis, the impact, if we don't make a difference, could be measured in famine. AI in the pharmaceutical industry can have a huge impact, especially with drug trials, which can take years to complete. Time to market is costly, and AI can speed up this process to approval. AI helps to apply machine learning to a complex range of data sets, increasing the discovery of new pathogens and molecules. It can transform research by cross-referencing published scientific materials with alternative resources, including clinical trial results, to develop drugs and discover new effective treatment methods for rare diseases. Here are some examples of progress in healthcare using AI, machine learning and increasingly deep learning. Example, precision oncology, drug discovery, imaging digital pathology, next generation sequencing, patent data management, always loads of data and much analysis needed. Gartner has seen AI as a game changer for the oil and gas sector. Upstream is capital intensive with enormous uncertainties and challenges that they face. Amid a growing pressure to cut operational costs, Big Oil is looking to automate its processes using artificial intelligence to predict equipment failure and ensure no pitfalls in the production environment. The same with midstream and downstream, as all sectors of the economy that energy serves are in transition going forward. The shift from oil and gas to a wider energy world means a huge role for data. Pulling together all classes of data from the energy sector, formal regulatory and unstructured data can be collated, but more needs to be done to add or extend value from the data generated. Cadme's Lumen platform is a case in point. As a data platform, Lumen is agnostic on servers, flexible on data sets, rigorous on standards, hence OSDU here, and all this makes for 3D, data-driven decision-making. Lumen is a catalyst for a range of partnerships with cloud services, legacy and leading-edge systems and third-party applications. Lumen is relevant to other sectors beyond energy. Here are some of the benefits generated by AI in the energy and specifically oil and gas sector. Upstream, we're talking automation for information access and diagnostics, reduction in dry well exploration, quicker closure of exploration and drilling projects, improved equipment availability and reduced downtime. Cost savings in all of this, as well as on downstream, enhanced collaboration and partnership impact on value addition through shared data, driving value stream optimization efforts with impact on costs and increased sales opportunities. 
Let's go wider than energy and consider risk. For example, how should the logistics and supply chain approach respond when it is so tuned in to an ever cheaper and faster business model delivering everything just in time? A need for resilience to climate, COVID and conflict demands a rethink. Now we have to consider sustainability, materials, energy usage, waste. We need to focus resilience higher inventories, more local sourcing, and so on. Plenty of data, but in silos, highly fragmented. Pulled together, we're talking data-driven decision-making. Impossible without AI and machine learning. Staying with risk, insurance. AI can automate repetitive knowledge tasks, for example, classify applications and process claims. AI can generate insights from large, complex data sets to augment decision-making. What does this actually mean? Well, smart devices and surveillance will help. Automated applications and claims we've touched on, interactive bots answering queries, visual analytics and damage assessment, predictive analytics for proactive measures, streamlined customer service and improved margins. Using AI, insurers get better equipped to assess risks, detect fraud and reduce human error. The days of big power stations are over as a more distributed approach opens up, served by a more complex energy mix. A smart grid pulls together all variables. Again, AI is an enabler. The illustration highlights how housing, workspaces and transport can all be integrated. Then a balancing of energy needs is met. AI makes this all possible. Let's sum up the story so far. Given all of the examples raised, AI plays a significant role in maximizing business opportunities as well as optimizing operational costs. To illustrate the approach, here's how AI and related technologies can pull together and add value with data in any sector. The goal is to consolidate data into the insight engine, sometimes called a data lake. And this is in the middle of the graphic. To feed it, we gather data using application servers, including legacy systems, structured and unstructured data, and there are web and mobile applications to access. All of this is enabled by cloud-based services, and this is augmented through partnerships and other cloud resources. By the way, this is a composite image for illustrative purposes, and the central image is the Lumen Insight Engine from Cadme. We move to the dark side. Let's not forget AI and its application in software-defined warfare. Sadly, Ukraine is a laboratory in which the next form of warfare is being created. It's not a laboratory on the margins, but a center stage, relentless and unprecedented effort to fine-tune, adapt and improve AI-enabled or AI-enhanced systems for immediate deployment. In addition to aerial systems, autonomous ships, undersea drones for mine hunting and uncrewed ground vehicles, all have been deployed, but one significant area being used is on images. AI is used to analyze satellite images, but also to geolocate and analyze open source data, such as social media photos in geopolitically sensitive locations. Neural networks are used, for example, to combine ground level photos, drone video footage, and satellite imagery to enhance intelligence in unique ways to produce strategic and tactical intelligence advantages. This is the the tragic paradox. Each day that the conflict continues and human beings are losing their lives in horrible ways, AI systems are being trained with real data from a real battleground, not to stop the suffering and end the war, but to become more effective in fighting the next one, the AI war. This is the end of command and control, the beginning of smart wars. Then there's the important work of Windward, an Israeli company, tracking the behavior of shipping. Tracking all ships at sea, they can highlight rogue shipping activity, pirates, 
loading and unloading offshore in the middle of the night. Ships busting sanctions. Here are some numbers. Ships manipulating GPS has risen by 59%. 44% of these are Chinese fishing vessels, for example. 19% of ships that go dark are repeat offenders. AI is the framework and the tool to pattern deeper insights into shipping worldwide. All of that said, our examples have answered the question, can we, in multiple sectors. Now we should shift to, should we, or stick our heads in the sand. Now for our final section three, the challenge. We live in a world of VUCA, volatility, commodity prices are up and down, availability of supplies, then uncertainty, climate change puts all businesses under pressure, energy needs are up and down, COVID has closed ports and cities overnight, that's dislocation, and complexity, just watch the news. Then there's ambiguity, politicians and businesses saying one thing, and doing another. And all of this goes haywire when the next black swan arrives. We need some solid ground to work from, set the scene where AI and machine learning can help us achieve our goals. Back to the future. Here we are in 2050. This will be a world of 10 billion people, up from 7 billion now. 75% living in urban areas, up from roughly 50-50 in 2011. And we could be living in a world that is 5 degrees warmer. All governments and firms, multinational small firms or startups need to spend time working on the business and not just on the day-to-day -day within the business. We need to make more of the data we have, unstructured as well as structured and regulatory. Not just the words, but also the images. Ahead of 2050, the catalyst has to be carbon zero. This is a sustainable way of thinking, getting rid of waste in all its form, for starters. It's not just a set of targets for natural capital and renewable energy, global health, food security, lifelong learning. All of these need to be addressed going forward. Given the 2050 challenge, the UN's SDGs, which target 2035 first, are seeking to deploy AI. This is to capitalize on the immense volume of data available to help meet the world's greatest challenges. AI can help to detect, present and scale up use cases. AI can help monitor progress, simulate implications, predict outcomes of measures taken and offer recommendations for policy makers. The world has to meet these SDG targets. AI will be an essential part of the solution. All is not easy with AI. A recent New Scientist leader acknowledged that progress has been made, yet none of it is magic. And those creating AIs, says the New Scientist, need to stop acting like it is. Sam Altman of OpenAI told the New York Times back in 2019, I tried to be upfront. Am I doing something good or really bad? The answer to that question is seemingly still up for debate for the CEO and many others. At the time, he likened OpenAI's work to the Manhattan Project. That's the United States' efforts to develop the atomic bomb during World War II. While he told the newspaper he thought AGI could bring a huge amount of wealth to people, he also admitted that it may end up ushering in the apocalypse. Now that ChatGPT is out in the open and the discussion surrounding the safety of AI is at fever pitch, something that has brought tremendous wealth to OpenAI, Altman is singing a notably different tune and now arguing that the concerns perhaps were overblown. In fact, Altman shares the same concerns as others. We must answer questions on alignment fast. 
and to those with a more philosophical position. Dr Ian McGilchrist has been consistent. To be or not to be, this is the question with AI. As a medical doctor and psychiatrist, his work on the brain has tackled the challenge of AI, and he traces the way forward back to the wiring of the brain and its various biases. In simple terms, the brain's left half is primarily responsible for maths and science, planning, ordered sequencing and speech. The right side of the brain is responsible for impulse and intuition, creative writing, image processing, spatial thinking. The right side is more adept at holistic thinking, and this is hugely important when we evaluate AI. We must stand back and take stock. McGilchrist's hugely impressive body of work encourages us to consider many angles. This is far too important to leave it just to technology. It was said by Shelley that the world was not run by poets, but should be run by those who are influenced by it. So too runs the argument from McGilchrist. Decisions on AI must be taken holistically and with long-term impact as important as short-term gain. More right-hand than left-hand brain is needed. The point I'm making here is that philosophers, not just technologists, have a part to play in the evaluation of AI. After all, as musician Frank Zappa once said, the computer can't tell you the emotional story. It can give you the exact mathematical design, but what's missing is the eyebrows. After all, at present, AI builds from all text output of humanity, and that leaves quite a few gaps. We move on to ChatGPT, and this has continued to dazzle the internet with AI-generated content, morphing from a novel chatbot into a piece of technology that is driving the next era of technological innovation. Not everyone's on board yet, though, and you're probably wondering, what's all the fuss about? ChatGPT is a natural language AI chatbot. At its most basic, that means you can ask it any question and it will answer. As opposed to a simple voice assistant like Siri, ChatGPT is built on what's called an LLM, Large Language Model. And these neural networks are trained on huge quantities of information from the internet for deep learning. This is implied in the concept and name of ChatGPT, which stands for Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer. In the case of the current version of ChatGPT, it's based on ChatGPT 3.5. The model behind ChatGPT was trained on all sorts of web content, including websites, books, social media, news articles, and more, all fine-tuned in the language model by both supervised learning and reinforcement learning from human feedback. OpenAI says this use of human AI trainers is really what makes ChatGPT stand out. And this is a development that we need to consider closely. We've come a long way. Time to highlight the consequences of all this technical progress and philosophical questioning. That is, the need for regulation, and then what to do with the impact on employment. First, regulation. A huge topic, let's be clear. If the model is to learn from the Food and Drug Administration drug approval process, we could be talking years. Preclinical, clinical, new drug application, post-marketing. Here we could be talking use cases, impact on local context, and so much more. Is this feasible with the pace of AI right now and for the foreseeable future? On the other hand, can we handle AI and all its ramifications without some form of regulation? Now let's consider the job market. OpenAI of ChatGPT fame has crunched the numbers on different jobs exposure to AI, and the numbers are eye-opening. They found around 80% of the US workforce could have at least 10% of their work tasks affected by GPTs. Around 19% of workers, meanwhile, could see at least 50% of their tasks impacted. The question is, how are we going to manage the transitions? And does this mean universal basic income to cover basic needs for those displaced? 
job losses are in the mix of implementing AI. More specifically, I reviewed the census returns for 1911 in Britain. Jobs for men working with horses, women in service. New technologies arrive and accelerated by World War I, such that 40% of the jobs were lost. The census of 1921 comes along and new jobs for drivers of vans and trucks. The key point is it starts with tasks. For example, new household appliances come in, washing machines, hoovers. These don't replace jobs. They automate routine tasks. And this is the same with AI. In this scenario, AI and related technologies improve productivity, which has been the real issue for decades. In turn, this would reduce inflation. And the argument runs, support universal basic income, meaning a minimum wage for those displaced. Transitions from one technology to another are rarely handled well at scale. Miners losing their jobs didn't walk into another career easily in the 1980s in Britain. The developed world is full of towns left behind as key industries declined. Maybe we need more on what has been called a science of human guidance. Perhaps too much effort on database or reasoning engine will not help. More is needed on the philosophical questions. Should we be doing this? What are the boundaries, the regulatory framework? Do we even agree where these should be? And the bad news is that consensus is not strong on specifics. Let me leave you with one possibility. We need to combine competition with collaboration. That's co-petition, coined by Nelbuff and Brandenburger in the 1990s. This is all about how a customer appreciates your product more when it is combined with another. A burger more when it is combined with the ketchup. A complementer. AI can help business to simplify and combine workflows, but we have to be open to collaborate. And this is the same with new ideas. No startup can be an island, and AI can help maximize revenues as well as optimize cost. Enough said. We started with a simple brief. Illuminate the challenge of AI. Highlight the pros and cons. We have given ample evidence of the answer to can we, but we need to ensure that we have strong answers and safeguards to should we. If we don't, AI may well be man's last invention. After all, as Elon Musk puts it, AI doesn't have to be evil to destroy humanity. If AI has a goal and humanity just happens to get in the way, it will destroy humanity as a matter of course, without even thinking about it. No hard feelings. This is Pause for thought. This has been Rob Bell with the talk given to start up the Illuminate conference on AI held in Stavanger, Norway, 26th of April, 2023. For more business topics, go to YouTube, Rob J. Bell webinars, like and subscribe when you can. There's more in the pipeline. Thanks for listening.